Hello, Robin. How you doing? Haven't seen Hi. you in a while. How you doing, James? How you doing, Debbie? Hello, Debbie. Hello. How you doing, Robin? I'm doing, I'm doing great. How are I'm you doing? I'm just going to repeat Jim's question. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Um. Hello, James. <clears throat> Hello, Mr. Berlin. How are you, sir? Fine, Mr. Bosley, but I think we should use first names. I think we already know each other reasonably well. Yes, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, somehow we can distinguish you from me because we have the same initials. So sometimes in the report, it'll say JB. And I wonder if I, you know, I'm... My middle name is Alberto, so maybe I'm J-A-B. And I, without telling you what the I stands for, am J-I-B. <laughs> but I don't like it. Well, so yeah. they, 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 could, they could certainly do that. So both of our names spell words. Yes, three-letter words. Jib and jab. Imagine that. It's like poetry. So when are they going to let you out of prison, Robin? I see the bars behind you. N next week. OK. <laughs> hey, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone is all right. Good evening, Leo. Hello, Leo. How you doing, Leo? How are you guys? How's, how's your well, start of the week? So how, how was your last your April? Good. On my end, it was it's great. That's always good to hear. How about yours, Leo? Very busy, man. Tax season is over, so I'm a little happy about that, but... We're very busy. Which is good. This is good. You know, time go fly. Exactly, Robert. Robin, you know. Has anyone heard from Debbie? Yes, yeah, she's here. She was on earlier. Yeah. Oh, okay. Must have missed her. <clears throat> she vanished. <clears throat> I expect she'll be back. Yeah, I think she comes in. We should have quorum. I believe there's eight of us. So it would be five present with Debbie. Right. Four times I had to tell my other iPad to attach to a network and three times it said it couldn't and now it can. I just, this is just so annoying, this electronics. And, and they say technology is smart, right, John? Well, actually, the reason I think they call, they call it the cloud is because it's not always there. Yeah, Maria has arrived. I wonder what happened to let me text <clears throat> Hey. 
Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Hello, Maria. Hey, Maria. Hey, you. Is that Jacob? Is that Jacobs? No. No. Maria. I've been, I've been getting I've been getting a request for French for friend on Facebook. Some some na someone named Jacobs. I have no idea who it is, so I ignore it. But it keeps coming back and back and back. I don't remember. I think I had a, a schoolmate years ago. And his name was Jacob, but I don't remember the last name. Anyway, okay. There's also Jacob Banners. He's a board member, so it might be him. Well, maybe he should put his last name on. Uh, if it's him. How's everybody? How's everybody after all this rain yesterday? Well, that was crazy. Absolutely crazy. I got a text from Debbie saying, sorry, having issues, be back as fast as I can. Um, do, if we have a quorum, I suppose, you know, Debbie won't mind or anyone else if the Leo begins the meeting. But if we don't have a quorum, we still have to wait. Um, let me see. James, Bruce, Jay. Yeah, I think we have quorum. Jay Mazer, CJ Mazer. Uh, ah, good, good, yeah. I'm uh, welcome, Jay. Okay, so that being said, I believe we have. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for attending our monthly meeting. My name is Leo Jimenez. I am the co chair of, or the assistant chair of uh, traffic and transportation. Our chair, Debbie, is having some technical difficulties, so she'll be back uh, shortly, hopefully. Um, I We'll go ahead and introduce the other committee members as well. We have James Berlin. Hello. We have Bruce Robertson. Uh, can you promote uh, Marshall Vanderpool and Vivian Ducat, who are board members, into the meeting, uh, please? Yeah, let me... Is Shinobi... Vivian is not a board member, but she's a... a oh, okay, public... So we could, we could, you know, she's a public member of the committee, so we could promote... Yeah, so is Marshall, so... So okay, yeah. Yeah, so now if you can, uh, I don't have that. You can help me now for a moment. Okay, okay, well they can chime in through me if they have to, but uh, okay. Vivian can't say that long anyway. Thank you. Sorry. No worries. Thank you, Bruce, for bringing that up. Uh, we have Robin Cruz. Hi guys. James Bosley. And uh, Jay Mazer. So um, we, well, Debbie come back. She'll explain a little better. Uh, with Mostly for this agenda, we're going to kind of follow up on a couple of uh, issues we have discussed in the past. Um, we're going to go through, uh, is Jody Hurston on by any chance? I know, Bruce, you might have uh, went to the walkthrough or where well, you were at the walkthrough. Um, I believe we want to discuss and kind of give the, the committee, uh, you know, what were the pros and cons from it? Uh, how do you see the DOT? Uh, what did you show? Or, you know, what, what went on in the conversation with DOT and the other representatives that attended uh, the walkthrough? So we'll get to that, and then we'll tackle a couple of uh, new business things. Um, uh, as you guys heard in the previous uh, meeting, uh, there was, a, well, one of the committee, uh, community board members, Domingo Stavis, brought up a topic about... Um, Easy pass and where is to do certain local representatives stand on or have a stance and uh, to the decision with the, for the governor to veto uh, the bill asking for uh, more transparency, uh, lower uh, cash toll fees if you pay late within a certain days, among other things. So we're going to have a discussion around that and see if, uh, you know, I know I went to the state assembly member and he had a vote, I'm not sure what he voted for, but. If we could maybe, you know, bring it to his attention and see where he stands and what he's trying to do as well as uh, Senator Robert Jack, uh, Jackson. So um, I guess uh, we don't have Jody here. Bruce, would you like to give an overview and uh, just give us details on what happened with the walkthrough? Any successes? 
Uh, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize it as best I can. There were a lot of details. Uh, Lyle Blackwood from DOT met us all on the Upper Riverside in front of uh, Jody's building, 870. We showed Lyle around some of the issues of the roadway and work that Jody's doing with uh, uh, the hospital to uh, improve the, the area there. We showed the uh, uh, the hill, the hill which is really full of garbage and so forth that needs to be cleaned up. We talked about the uh, truck standing or truck loading zone that, that Jody's been pushing for. And then we walked down the hill and went to 158 and looked at the intersection, which is like spaghetti, and... Um, mentioned one of the issues that Maria brought up, which was that she and her sister almost got run over. Oh, okay. So Debbie's here too. She can chime in. So Debbie actually walking up to where we were almost got hit at 158 intersection. And then Maria has been uh, pushing for either a, a traffic light re recalibration or a stop sign and, and even moreover, a ramp that goes from the sidewalk on the northern part of the riverside down to the southern riverside or middle riverside, as we call it. So there are a lot of issues that came up like that. Lyle was really good at capturing the details. And he said some of the things he can work with directly with uh, DOT uh, doesn't have to go through the committee or resolutions or anything. And then we walked around 157. We looked at that area, talked about the traffic there, down Riverside to in front of 790, where there's a kind of a, I don't know what do I want to call it, a yield stop sign, which is really kind of subject to a driver interpretation that said there really needs to be a real stop sign here because people are just kind of skimming through. And he said, we can, we can do that. So that's kind of the top line view. Debbie, if you want to pitch in because uh, Jody's not here right now. I'd appreciate it. Yeah, I'm actually, and we're going to, I'm just going to say a few things. Sorry, I had it just completely got bounced out and couldn't get in on the phone or for a while or or here. Because um, I, I'm sorry, I told MTA that they could go first. So I want to come back to this, but I will just say to tie up, because um, it sounds like you, you gave a very good summary of I mean, we really got a lot done, um, but there's so much there. Um, I mean, we congratulated we congratulated Lyle and DOT for the work that was done with the median and so forth, uh, much to some neighbors' consternation. But it's really working well and slowing traffic. And congratulations right. for a DOT project that actually uh, got implemented and it's working. Right. I think the the big takeaway. Um, well, I, I guess a few things. One, that the sort of hottest, to me, the, the the red hottest priorities amongst all those things, which we will follow up on all of them, um, and Jody's been just phenomenal on that as well, is the um, that if people remember when the when the pedestrian safety work was done two years ago, that or now more than that. Um, what we didn't contend with was a very long crossing, and I'm sorry if I'm being repetitive with Bruce, a very long crossing on 158th from the upper roadway um, down to the middle roadway. And in fact, as I went to join the the group, um, I almost got, you know, wiped out by a car making a right there. Um, and so two things came out of that is that it seemed like it was an absolute prime location for um, the latest and greatest thing in the DOT toolkit in this regard, which is these raised crosswalks. And they're fantastic. Um, and then also, as Bruce said, the issue that shockingly, there, there are no curb cuts, like it's all messed up there. So that that generally, and then as Bruce said, the top of what really is a stair street um, not having any stop sign and that intersection desperately needing it. So while a couple blocks up, they, it probably wouldn't hurt. Um, you know, those were sort of two, two very, very red hot 
um, locations, you know, in addition to a whole other list of things, which, um, which Bruce just covered and um, Lyle is, is sort of trafficking. Ably so. So we really had fun. It was neat for me because I don't know the area super well, and I certainly don't know it on foot. Um, and because I didn't get wiped out by a speeding car, it all went well. Um, <laughs> so, um, so James was there. James, you want to chime in on anything that we might have missed? Well, yeah, I think the, the thing that I really, uh, it was a learning experience for me having this, my first walkthrough with you guys, and it was very informative. Um, but I think it was Debbie who uh, suggested uh, uh, a turn arrow on that area of uh, Riverside Drive, which would make it easy for those cars to turn and without other cars, you know, barging in and then, you know, interfering with, well with the pedestrian traffic. I thought yes. that, was, that was the biggest thing. Right. That, you know, that face, the face that, you had that was yeah. I thought was really cool. The light timing was a big discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was, I mean, and we were there during rush hour. So it was interesting. And what we're describing is there's a real like face off that happens with people going sort of southish um, from the middle roadway and then facing head on the Edward Morgan people he heading, you know, north ish. And everybody, everyone, everybody yeah. wants a yeah. piece of that six, you know, five or six way turn. Um so, all right, so let's um, take Maria, and then I think I want to just, again, accommodate MTA, and then we can we can come back again if, if people have sort of additional thoughts that occur to them. I'll, I'll be brief. Thank you so much, Debbie. And the, I couldn't go to the walk up because so you, the other said that since I'm not a member, I wasn't invited to the, you know, the walkthrough, um, and because I was not an official member of this, particular committee. So I said, we have already discussed a lot. But one of the things that I, I noticed was left out, uh, when you had a, that incident, Debbie, uh, that bicycle lane, that it makes so diff difficult for the people coming down south to make that turn. And this is what I have observed since I live here forever and ever, the, dif the, the difficulty of making that, you know, that turn right on the upper drive, and then also making the right turn on the lower drive. So I'm sorry that that wasn't brought up too, because well, I also I mentioned think, about the, yeah, yeah, no, I just- no, I think we captured that, that comment. comment. Yeah, I think okay, we good. captured that right. comment. I, I don't so necessarily, yeah. Yeah, but that that's really, uh, uh, we need to, you know, to look into that also. Thank you, dear. Thank you, as always. Um, I'm just sort of looking at people's comments. Okay. Um, and thanks, Vivian, for first, you know, being here tonight, because I know you were there from the start on the original work that was done in the area. I'm just seeing you in the chat now. Let's, um, but please don't put anything substantive um, in the chat. And, um, you know, that's just like if you need an address or something like that. Um, again, we can we can come back to this again if anything comes up, but I think we've, you know, we'll just keep people updated um, as things, you know, we hear things. And then um, Lyle and I will be sort of have a call to go over some of these outstandings in the next week or two. Um, so, and I'll, we've got a bunch of updates for tonight, but what I'd like to do is uh, Megan and Sean, have you um, go now, and then we can do any updates from the MTA, and then get back get get back to it. Thanks for being here with us tonight. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you to the committee members for allowing us some time this evening. I'm Megan Molina. I'm an assistant director of government and community relations for New York City Transit. I do cover um, Manhattan Community Board 12 for our team. I'm also joined um, by Sean Fitzpatrick, who is our uh, deputy chief of staff for MTA Construction and Development. 
So um, the first item for us um, really pertains to the 168th Street station. Um, earlier this year in February, we did announce that this um, station um, has been identified uh, to receive ADA upgrades on the one line. And so award is expected for that project to happen later in this year, at which point we will come back to the board with a more thorough briefing. But for right now, we wanted to just specifically discuss um, easement um, and parkland alienation. So for that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sean to speak to that in more detail. Great, thank you, Megan, and thanks everyone for having me. Um, I'm gonna share my screen if, or I, I can't, but if, if I could share my screen, it's helpful. If not, uh, it's not the end of the world. This is, it'll be the, oh, there we are. Um, la last year we were before you um, for a, uh, to, to we need parkland alienation in order to make this, um, in order to make this project happen. So this is, uh, as Megan noted, to make the 168th Street station um, fully accessible, including the transfer between the one and the A and C trains. Um, you know, I, this is uh, the same presentation you got last year, but I'll run through it really quickly just to remind folks what the project is. Um, you know, it's a, a unusually deep station, as I'm sure folks know. And so we're, it's a, it's a complicated and expensive project, but one that we are excited to be prioritizing within this capital program and to be moving forward with. Um, it will make the one train accessible as, as well as making that transfer to the AC accessible. Um, this will be done through a new elevator from the mezzanine to the northbound platform and a new elevator that connects the existing high capacity elevators to the southbound platform. And it'll also add some additional emergency egress stairs to make it a safer station in case of an emergency. Um, so this is showing sort of what that looks like. You've got the uptown side here on the left and the downtown side on the right. You know, a new um, elevator to the street or from the street to the mezzanine, and then the ability to get down to the um, down to the uptown side as well. So, because of the location of this within the um, footprint of Mitchell Square and the Broadway Mall, um, there's a need for what's called parkland alienation. I'm sure you all are familiar. Uh, this is both uh, to um, accommodate uh, what are ultimately subsurface uh, long uh, permanent easements. So the fact that we're putting elevator shafts underneath the mall and underneath uh, Mitchell Square Park means that you won't be able to plant certain types of trees. It in some ways limits the use of the parkland. And so for that reason, uh, parkland alienation is required. We will also during construction need to have additional space for staging. Um, generally that area north of the War Memorial in Mitchell Square Park. Um, this is all the same exact stuff that we discussed last year um, and that was approved thanks to, you know, we, we appreciate your support and the support of your elected officials in, in the city council and in the state legislature. The issue we ran into, and this is, um, oh, and just to note, you know, the same plan, we're working very closely with the New York City Parks Department so that we will restore everything um, better than we found it um, and are, are, you know, pleased to do that. Um, so thank, thanks to all of your support, we were able to get that passed last year, which was the critical thing in order to allow us to move forward with the ADA project. As uh, you know, additional layers of legal review happened at the end of last session, uh, we realized that there were a few typos, and it literally is as simple as that. Um, you can see them listed on the, on the screen here. Um, there, there were a couple of instances where numbers got transposed. We put an east instead of a west somewhere. Um, and, and inaccurately described the Broadway Mall. Um, so it is it is very, very technical minor stuff, but in order to have the alienation legislation be 100% accurate um, and sort of you know leave the, the, the law books um, pristine, we're asking the state legislature uh, and the city council and, and with your support to go in and change that and just clean up these typos so that they aren't there anymore. Um, so it, the, the sort of the substance of the request is as simple as that. Also happy to, as, as Megan alluded to, give a pro, an update on the project itself. Um, we are moving forward this year with the award of the contract. It will be a design build contract um, and that we expect it to take something like four years, although we'll have a more detailed schedule once we have our design builder on board. We anticipate that being something that happens, you know, kind of in the second half of this year, um, probably, you know, near the end of the year. So that, that's the update. Happy to answer any questions or refresh any memories from what we talked about last year, but you know, we are back for um, 
well, uh, typo uh, control here. So thank you. Thank you, Sean. I mean, I'm just curious, and I know we have to wait till you come back um, once it's been awarded and you present it, uh, the project uh, when it's getting ready to launch. Um, but am I right to infer from what you just said um, about the length of the project, et cetera, that it will be more complicated than what we are for example, seeing at 181st Street A station and it will necessitate more weekend full closures of the of that station? It, it is it is too early to get into what the sort of weekend closures will look like. I will say that while it is a it is a complicated station and it is more complicated than 181st Street in a lot of ways, a lot of that is driven by just how deep it is and by the fact that there's a need to um, you know go through. 80 plus feet of the, um, you know, hard Manhattan rock. So it, I, I don't, that will not necessarily be impactful on the um, sort of at the station level. Um, you know, so I, it's premature to get into sort of what the, um, you know, what the outages will look like. But I will say that it, the complexity is driven mostly sort of significantly above the uh, station level. Uh, it sort of will be coming down from the street that will be the most expensive and challenging part of the project. Um, Jim and then Maria. Um, thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, just for some of us who may be new to this, the second um, a parcel of land is designated, designated a park, you need an act of the state legislature to make it not a park. And that, that process is called alienation. It's, it's a, a method of protecting the parks. So in order for a section of this park to be used, and, and my question, by the way, and I think I, we already know the answer because you, know, you, you, you guys try to do an excellent job. The area that's alienated that you're gonna mess with, it will ultimately be a flat surface that people can walk around on and stuff like that. It won't be fenced off or anything like that. A absolutely. During construction, the, we do oh, have yeah. a temporary easement, but when we return it uh, at the end of the project, uh, for parks use, it will look, you know, just like it does today, but brand new and with, you know, some minor design improvements from the parks department. Right. And technically that tiny footprint won't be a park. Well, technically Who knows? It, will, it will, it will still be a park, but we will have an easement below the ground. So okay. it's sort of in order for the parks department, not just to give up a parcel of land, but even to grant an easement, you need to go through that same alienation process that you described so well. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. And, and again, you know, my experience, I'm not just saying this, you know, when, uh, you know, and I'm, I don't work for the transit authority, um, when they do things, I, I find that, you know, I mean, nothing is perfect. They, they, you know, try to do a really fine job. So I, and I'm, I'm certain, and, and this is, as you point out, an extremely complicated project. Um, even getting from the A train part of the station to where the elevators go to the one train, that's going to be a problem because that ramp is too steep. Right. And you're dealing with a ramp that's too steep at 184th Street now. So by, so by then you'll be experts on it. But so again, we appreciate what you're doing. And let me just invoke one of our, our former board members, the late Edith Prentice, who was a handic an advocate for the disabled. And she referred to the rest of us as the temporarily able. So all of these projects may very well be very helpful to all of us at some point. Thank you. Thank you. And, and yeah, thank you for invoking Edith. Um, Maria and then James. Yeah, um, that same ramp that Jim is uh, talking about by the, the uh, um, Broadway, uh, where you used to have like a new stand, can they, you know, maybe they could just walk, do something really nice looking, coming from the, you know, the, eliminating those steps, right? That's what you're talking about. Eliminating the street, coming coming north from, you know, 168. And then there are some steps, there's something like a high and then there are a few steps. Can that be smooth out um, and go down by where the, um, the talking booth used to be? And then the, now there is like a, um, a gate, that could be probably, uh, eliminated or uh, you know amended 
in order to make like a really smooth pass into the elevators going to the number one train. I mean, that particular area, I think that if someone that have, you know, some design experience could really do something beautiful there and not to not too expensive because they don't have to dig or anything like that. But something that, that should be considered um, on that particular area because I, we use it a lot. So I just don't know if I, you know, someone just uh, know what I'm talking about, but it's like this most right in front by the Presbyterian Hospital, the, the uh, what you call it, the emergency room area on that going down that there is like a lot of, you know, garbage. But anyway, that can be smoothed out, those steps. Eliminate those steps, but leave the, the steps from Broadway on Broadway coming from 168 down into the station. Leave those steps there for something maybe like a nice curve type of thing, art deco. You know, I can you know, probably make a design really nice, but maybe, and that I don't think it has to be, uh, you know, a long term, three years period type of a thing before it com is completed. I mean, about the park and the pigeon, the pigeon park. Okay, the, uh, okay. This, All right. I, think we got, park, I don't think we're at the design. Something yeah. <laughs> but I mean, this, I think that someone should look into that because I think it could be done really nicely and then make sure that the people with handicap, the wheelchair and people with walker can just slide down and get into the area where the elevator okay, is number Maria, one. Maria, I gotta, I gotta stop you. I gotta all stop right, you. You're, right, over, right, you're right, over time. Right, this right. is an ADA accessibility project. <laughs> Let's I know, but that is accessibility that I'm they talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about accessibility there. Yeah. I, I appreciate the comment. And yeah, as, as Debbie's alluding to, we will have more details as the design progresses, um, but I appreciate it. Um, James Bosley. I'm curious, do you, can you tell now which line would be affected more, the A, C, or the one? I, I would imagine it will be the one primarily, uh, given the um, that that's where the work will be happening, sort of at the sort of platform level. Um, but I can't guarantee that there won't be any sort of spillover impact to the AC. Um, but that we'll have much more kind of this time next year. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll. We'll look forward to learning more. I mean, I know it's everybody's priority to make stations accessible. Um, and as we have said for years, you know, as the um, home of high elevation and deep stations, it's particularly a priority for us. And so we're thrilled to see this stuff coming down the pike. And as long as we are remembering Edith Prentice, I always like to say in this moment, that our former and late chair, uh, Richard Lewis, who I could sometimes have a good argument with about some of this stuff, always, always, always contended through thick and thin, you can make the one train accessible. And, we're, and, and it was always like, no, you can't. Um, so I wish he were here with us for a lot of reasons, but certainly to see this. Um, Jim, did you have another question or is that an old hand? Okay. Um, Megan, can I ask you um, for the two things we discussed a little earlier, if you've got anything to share? Again, I think just so people know, we have as many updates as available have gone out. There's nothing new to say about the ADA project at the north end of the 180. Debbie, can I interrupt you real quick? If we're going to move on, I just want to let Sean go because he, he was oh. only here to speak to 168. So I want to take up the rest of Sean's time for this evening and then I'll stick around for the other questions. Okay, great. Sean, it was nice to see you, meet you. Um, and thanks for being with us tonight. And we'll look forward to seeing you next year. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Debbie. Um, so uh, we, we're, we don't have sort of additional updates now that the Overlook Terrace entrance has closed for the ramp work at 181st Street A station, but the south end of the station is sort of technically a separate project that replaced the escalators. And now the stair the stairways are closed um, because that's the last part of that project. Right. So I just asked Megan, if there's any sense since that had to kick off a little late 
Um, but this, those stairway rebuilds have been moving pretty quickly. Um, if there was an update about the when that's expected to reopen there's those stairways um because i am realizing that that means for people entering on the south side of the station you can't just go down to the platform you have to actually head north and then get down the stairs so it's added a little commute time you know so we're not we're not all the way there yet on that side after waiting you know for the escalators and that also any information she has about the next round of weekend closures at that station, uh, which do relate to um, often to this work specifically. Right. So, okay. Let, here's what I have so far for dates when it comes to the current stair closures. Right. So we had shortly after the escalators came back, which was on March 31st, we did the stair closure between the upper and lower mezzanine. And that happened, I believe it was April 10th that they closed. And right now we have the date for those to come back as um, July, 2023. So at, point, at some point in July, usually that means it's gonna be towards the tail end of the month, but that's what we have for right now. For the other stair closures that happened much more recently, I believe that was as of uh, the 22nd of April, those are the platform to lower MES stairs, or we refer to them as P1 and P2. Um, those are supposed to be closed through the end of this month. And that's it. Oh, really? Yeah, that's yeah, what I don't care about the says right now. And obviously, you know, as, as with everything else, if there are any changes on that end, I will let you know, but that's what we have currently posted. That was the timeline given to us by the contractors. Like you said, they tend to move pretty quickly on stairs. So, you know, our, okay. our hope here is that we stay um, in schedule with those. All right. That's great news. Is there anything I'm forgetting that we need to, uh, any? You want to know about the plan service changes. So I will send out a notice to uh, the board in writing, but we have the partial suspension for the A train um, between 168 and 207. Our next dates for the month of May for that are going to be um, the weekend of uh, May 12th through the 15th, and then also May 26th through the 30th. And it's the same um, same, you know, set of stations and the same timing, 9.45 p.m. to 5 a.m. that Monday. So I'll make sure I'll put that in writing for, for the board as well. Um, that's great. Thank you, Megan. Um, Jim, if that's a new hand, you're next. And then Jay Maser. Hi, Jay. Uh, that was an old hand. It's okay. Jay's turn. All right. Great. Jay? Um, I'm a little unclear about what you just said, Megan, about the staircases, but I was on the Uptown A train last week, and uh, I never actually felt the, the 184th Street exit to the staircase there was very safe. But I finally saw someone who was really uncomfortable, an older woman with uh, a, uh, a uh, with baggage, a small amount, uh, a, a small traveling bag just stood still. And I was about two persons away from her. And I looked back and there were about 10 people and we were all standing still. The woman just didn't feel safe to walk in that small walk space. And I don't know that anything could be done about it until construction is completed. But um, I always thought something like this might occur in that small walk space, which is the main way to get to the elevator to Fort Washington Avenue and 184th Street. Wait, so you're talking on the far north of the platform? Yes. Yeah, people just, if you're not comfortable, you don't take it. I mean, because those stairwells are open now between platform and mezzanine. You just, you just don't, 
turn left off the train, you turn right off the train. Like there was no, a bigger no, problem. You, you, no, they're not. Am I wrong that they're not open? Like it is oh. narrow, but like, then don't, I don't take it because it freaks me out. No? So, I, I mean, and I, I will say that part of the work that we're doing for this project is to make um, like these, like the boarding areas um, more accessible. So that does include like things like space constraints, um, but I'm not sure if I'm also understanding the question or the, the concern correctly. My concern is actually for the safety of people who are walking to the staircase to get to the elevator, to get to Fort Washington Avenue and 184th Street. And what Debbie so, said is one good solution, which is to take the other staircase. But what I noticed was, like I said, a, a woman who felt uncomfortable and just froze in her path. Um, and like I said, a crowd developed because no one could walk past her without walking on the tracks, of course, which no one was going to do. And I'm sure the problem will resolve itself when the track work has been completed. But my concern, as always, is, is for the safety of people walking on the track. Uh, now that woman just froze. What happens when we deal with a drunk coming home at three or four in the morning? All right, let's, I mean, I'm not sure this is one the MTA can really, like I actually thought that that entrance, that stairwell was gonna be completely shut for the duration of the project and it has been left open and it's very narrow. Many people are comfortable taking it. Probably Many of us would have are been not, safer if but, it had been shut. Yeah, um, but it's especially now that some of the platform to mezzanine stairwells are open again and people have, it's been going on long enough that, that most of us are familiar. We had a lot of feedback like this in the first few weeks. Okay. That, that that was the case, but there's a shed. And again, I think for the people who, who feel secure enough to take it, they appreciate having that one open while there's so many diversions. Right. Um, um, so what I can do, and, and this might also speak to Ian's comment in the chat, um, I do go to the station here and there, you know, as, as things pop up. Um, so I am happy to just go at some point in the near future and kind of walk through. I, I know our, you know, our customer service and experience team has done a um, really great job, at least trying to put uh, their best um, effort together for the materials that we put up in the station to assist with wayfinding. Um, but we're always looking to improve if that seems to be needed. So I'm, I'm happy to go yeah. you know, check that out and see what it currently looks like and see if there's anything that could be improved on that. That'd be great. Jim? Um, I just wanted to second what Ebby, what um, Debbie said, and um, also um, Ian's suggestion, you know, having an extra sign alerting the people that it's a narrow passageway, um, that would help. Um, if that particular way to the stairs hadn't been open, it would have inconvenienced tens of thousands of people by now. And, um, you know, the, you sort of have to weigh things. So I think it's a, a tremendous convenience. I think it, you know many most people are very happy it's there. Obviously, the lady didn't stay frozen forever since Jay is with us, or unless he turned around and went the other way. But um, I think he's overreacting. Um, and you know, we don't run the world so that you know drunk people are absolutely safe all the time, or else we'd have railings by every street. Cr you know that, that you know we that's not not how. It's not a practical way of running the world. So, and I've used it. In fact, I go out of my way to be in the front car of the train to make that available to me. And I'm personally very thankful that it's there. So I, you know, I have great respect for Jay, but I disagree with him on this point. All right. Well, Megan, um, thank you for, um, you know, keeping on top of everything as well as you have. I know that there's been 
a lot a lot of community feedback at every sort of piece of this double project at that station. So I appreciate, um, you know, your presence and consistency during these months. I know you were like kind of new coming into it as that was launching. So you've, you've really, <laughs> you've really absorbed all of it. Um, yeah. so, um, thank you for being here tonight. And, um, I think, yeah, I think that's going to be it for MTA matters. And um, Lyle, I'm just going to do some updating. I'll try to keep the DOT things next um, in terms of like old business and stuff like that. Um, but Megan, you know, anytime you decide you've had, you know, <laughs> you're ready to be done, I'll let you go. And if you want to stay, great. Thank you, um, Debbie. I just I appreciate um, your time as always. And just for, you know, always giving me a call to let me know what's going on and for giving us a chance to, to work together to improve things here and there. I know this project is um, needed, but can pose inconveniences at times. So we just want to make sure we're doing our best to fix things wherever possible in between. Um, great. All right. We'll speak soon, I'm sure. Um, all right. So let me just go through... Um, I just got like a stack of papers. So let me try, Lyle, try to keep on the DOT stuff next. Um, so um, as you know, we have a big project going on in the district. This is bridge discussions at the Broadway Bridge, as well as um, the Riverside Drive Viaduct Project, the many, 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 many years. Um, and I just, you know, each of those projects has a, like somebody that releases, like, here's, here's the construction for the week and how it's going to affect your ability to, um, use these roadways where the work is being done. And in the case of the Broadway bridge, it's been for like a year, the same update every week, you know, electric something or other electric, something or other week after week, it's been going on probably more than a year. And I noticed that this week, um, and I just wanted to read it because it's been sort of an ongoing thing with the, I mean, obviously on this committee, always about the Broadway bridge, our sort of troubled bridge, um, that it has now changed to conduit installation, control house, interior wall construction, and steel grid deck repairs um, on the Broadway bridge. So, it seems like some phase is perhaps behind relating to all the electrical challenges and work. And so that was that. Um, and then at the viaduct project, there was supposed to be this big like concrete pour and they had to delay it, I assume because of all the rain. So that is now scheduled for Saturday, May 6th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, that is a concrete pour the, on the west sidewalk between 153rd and 155th Street over Amtrak, weather permitting. One lane closure will be performed as per the schedule below. So one, so what they're gonna do is they'll have one northbound, one southbound, but um, all on the east side, and then they'll just, they're obviously gonna close up the west side um, completely. So it's gonna be a little, little tricky over there on Saturday. Um, and um, for, uh, I know there was actually somebody who's been attending our meetings for several months um, about the 181st street step street and all the sort of plantings on either side of those again something that i know on and off this committee has been involved with uh for many years always led by um the late great gene lee poji um and there is i guess a few other people who have are trying to pick up the mantle as best they can one of whom has been in contact with the office over the past couple of months and trying to get some airtime with us but really the issue is, you know, things are continue to be in disrepair um, and Ebenezer um, picked it up uh, this past month at DSC and Lyle is doing his best to, you know, keep things moving because we were delayed in terms of um, 
getting back to 181st Street Beautification Group about um, the conditions there. So, uh, Lyle, is there anything that one could add about that, or you're just starting your process of looking into it? Yeah, it's still under review um, with my colleagues. Uh, nothing to report yet. I was hoping to have something by this evening, but uh, still waiting to hear back from them. Um, I did hear from uh, uh, the group as far as their concerns. Uh, so I'm trying to see what I can do as far as uh, getting somebody to uh, take, take a look at that location a little bit uh, sooner. But uh, unfortunately, no new updates yet, but uh, I'll keep you posted. Okay. Thanks, Lyle. Um, I mean, I guess we've had milling, 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 paving, paving, paving. Um, anything else that I might be forgetting that we said we would talk about, Lyle, in terms of updates? Or should we just wait until after we go through things on the call? I think we're good. Yeah, we do have a call scheduled um, for next Thursday, I think it is. Uh, to go over some things regarding Riverside Drive. Um, so there should be some updates uh, available for the next meeting. And hopefully, okay. uh, yeah. So um, looking forward to that. I think that's uh, about it as far as issues I can think of right now. Um, but if there's anything else that you can think of or anybody else, um, you know, definitely reach out and I'll see if I can get some updates for you. Yeah, I mean, I just, I was put in mind, um, and I know, again, it's a long laundry list of things that came out of the walkthrough, but just in talking about the 181st Street, Stair Street, um, if we just make sure, again, that we clarify is at what's at West 160th Street between the upper and middle roadways of Riverside Drive, is that considered a stair, a step street? Um, the, the, which I would think, think it is but again com confirming that we will that will be helpful um jim did you have yes um i just wanted to make a general comment you know that um based upon the history of Jean lee poji and all she's done for this part of the community at some point someone somewhere ought to think of naming something for her, maybe that Step Street itself. Um, the other thing she was involved with is, is Dolphin Park, but of course that's already called Dolphin Park, I suppose. But, you know, again, she she was an absolute gem and, and you know, insofar as, you know, we can memorialize her, I think that would be a wonderful thing. Yeah, let me, I mean, I know this isn't exactly TNT, but let me say it anyway. Um, uh, Dolphin Park, as people know, was, you know, Port Authority paid for that. They took care of renovating it and because they had to sort of move some things for the, the restoring the George Project and the new North Walkway. And so they did that. They, they're they not, but there is currently to what it seems to be is there's no one to operate the park. And this is the issue of like, the good news is there was a community agreement made and, and they, and they, I guess will will provide some funding for it, but it didn't open last year. And it's not clear that it's going to open this year unless a group st sort of steps up. Um, and, you know, because it is like that, yeah, so that there's there's conversations, again, the person who came to us about the, the disrepair at 181st Street um, provided some information on the status of that to some community members that are sad because it is it's a small park but by those that live close by it is um it's it's treasured um because it is also just focused on really little kids so it's like a nice deal um it's just you know if anybody has any ideas of like who might be willing to do some community work around identifying people to make something happen and deal with court authority um 
I'm sure that would be very welcome. Um, because it's so, actually their property. Yes, yes. Right. But like, yeah, but they're not, yeah, they're not going to worry about who's going to like unlock the door. It has very limited hours and limited season. But no, I during agree that, time, that ideally someone should pick up, you know, the, the mantle and, and, you know. Right. And, but I mean, it has to be somebody works. who shows up there every day, all, you know, spring and summer. So, um, but anyway, so that's happening. Just want to put it in everybody's brains. Um, all right. I have two more things. Um, I want to, I want to just provide some information on the 5G situation. And Allegra, are you still around? Uh, yes. Oh, good. Hi. Um, so um, let me just say, so I'm going to say a few things, Allegra, about 5G, but then I want to, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what you dug up, even though, you know, that's mostly for public safety at this point, but Lyle, it's actually really interesting. So Allegra, do you have, can you stay with me just like a little longer? Oh, sorry. I'm just going to presume you can. <laughs> okay. This will, be, this will be quick. So, um, as best as I can, I will try to provide an update about the status of the 5G towers. It's it's like the most fog of war thing I've ever seen. Um, people might have seen in the past several days a news item about the program writ large and the FCC being involved. Um, so... Uh, there has been a lot of consternation about these polls, as we know in this uh, um, committee. So I'm just gonna actually read from the Times because I wanna get it right. Um, the FCC has said that the towers, each of them are subject to the FCC's environmental and historic preservation reviews. Um, that were not conducted before work was begun by City Bridge. So meaning for all future polls, plus the hundred that are in the ground, there needs like in the case of the ones in the ground, there needs to be a post construction review, but then something needs to happen before the future ones go. And what's super confusing is that, um, that the city bridge is sort of saying like, but it'll be fine. That won't cost us anything on our timeline. And then when I hear reviews like that, I'm not sure why it wouldn't affect the timeline. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the quote from Mayor Adams was as follows. And this sort of goes to, I didn't, as you know, when they presented here, I was like, why is City Bridge, who's just like a contractor presenting and not the city? But I think it's a lot more complicated because the quote in the from Mayor Adams was that City Hall was committed to enforcing provisions in our telecommunications franchise agreements to see that municipal franchisees like City Bridge adhere to all relevant regulations. Um, so meaning if that if they're referred to, it's not just a simple like I was talking to them, like they're just like they're just a vendor to New York City, but it's if they're called municipal franchisees, it's it's clearly bigger than that. As a practical matter, so things are a little bit on hold, but nevertheless, um, after that meeting, there was one other like sort of follow up conversation with the councilwoman, a staffer there. I was involved. Kathy was there. Um, just trying to work out like could there be more time for public comment and you know why hadn't we seen certain lists etc cetera, etc cetera. so while the public comment period is sort of set at 60 days and the city can't change that they are going to try to at least share it with cb12 in the future like as soon as they have them, which is sometimes a little bit before the public public comment. 
So at least we can sort of be at the ready to communicate to people that the public comment period is open. Um, the pending sites, and I'm, but by that, I presume that to mean the ones that were presented at, at this committee several months ago, um, the comment period was extended till May 15. And as a reminder, and to have it on the record, um, people can provide direct feedback at link 5G feedback at oti.nyc.gov. Again, link 5G feedback at oti.nyc.gov. Um, to my knowledge, that would include um, 11 Nagel, 689 Port Washington, where we obviously provided an immense amount of feedback already, 727 Port Washington, also discussed quite a bit, 100 Overlook, um, 3849 10th Avenue, 2145 Amsterdam, 2178 Amsterdam, 2194 Amsterdam, 515 West 182, and 4188 Broadway. Um, the last that I read, I think we're in a commercial zone although the 182nd street looks to me residential, but so I don't know why it says commercial, but um, I, I think what we hope to do for the future because CB12 is expected to get quite a few of these if it goes forward as contemplated is to, um, to be another channel by which we are communicating as quickly as possible broadly in the community about the comment pe period being open, um, but not necessarily, I'm not, we're not gonna have a meeting every time there's a new list, um, but uh, to just help help get the word out um, when each new set comes up. But we'll have to just see because while City Bridge is talking as if there's not gonna be a delay, this looks very delay to me. Um, and these things are massive, so I think, probably some additional reviews aren't a bad, bad thing, perhaps. So that's what I know. I know that was opaque, but that's all I got. Um, <clears throat> so now, um, and I think this is be the last thing I've got just in terms of updates and old business, et cetera. Obviously last month was our um, joint meeting with public safety. I was on the on the positive. I was um, pleased that after sort of thinking about it for so long that it happened. Um, and and thank you to our assistant chair for sort of getting it really over the line. Um, and so I, I think it was a great first effort. And then I hope maybe you know we do it once a year, even if it's just that we'll just invite traffic enforcement, you know, to one of our meetings. And so whether it's joint or it's not joint, I think it was um, something that we should do with some regularity. Um, I was profoundly disappointed that no one from traffic enforcement was at the traffic enforcement public safety meeting. So I am still left not completely, you know, I, I we could have had, yeah, that is, was not a good fact. And it, but, um, again, I think it was a first one and people had so much pent up. I mean, we've been listening for years as people are feeling vulnerable with speeding cars and near misses and motorized things on our sidewalks and and watching as you stand there with like a little kid and watching people blow through red lights and nothing happening. Like, I'm just glad we got it started. Um, so thank you to everybody's participation. Um, and again, just on, onward and upward. But one interesting thing, I mean, there were so many interesting things, but Allegra Legrand, who is, is so often in attendance at our committee meetings and certainly was in this case, made a very elegant point, which is that if you like, injuries and fatality and everything kind of rose during a period of time like tra as she says traffic violence really increased so was there a commensurate increase in like arrests 
And we didn't, there was no answer. And I don't think anybody really knew who was on the call, but because she's like data person extraordinaire, um, she actually figured it out. And so if I could just, yeah, I just want to give Allegra, cause I saw it just as I was leaving the office after like a really long work day. Um, Allegra, I'm just going to, can you like sum up in two or three minutes, like what you did and what it showed? Sure. Do you want to sh share the email I sent you? That'll be um, easier than hand waving. Uh, or I can hand. <laughs> you know, oh, you don't have to. You don't have to. So you don't, I, I, I know you always want to be precise. You can even be a little imprecise, but just. Okay, I'll, I'll hand wave. So <laughs> hand wave. Yeah. New York City. City Council in 2019, I think, voted in this open data law, which is really nice because it means that you can keep track of the way things are going in New York. And relevant to that, that conversation is, um, one, New York City keeps track of traffic violence. And traffic violence is a special citation that NYPD issues it's moving violation 104 a.m. And so you can download uh, the number of citations that are issued and the data set starts from mid 2012 and it continues till you know, today. And they classify each incident as being either um, a pedestrian, a cyclist or a motor vehicle injury or fatality. So they have these kind of six categories. And then uh, they tell you like um, which vehicle, what kind of vehicles were involved, was it a uh, you know, a, a bike, a bike v car, a car v pedestrian, they, they, you can look up all this information. So what you see when you look at a, um, a time series is that traffic violence, now the fatalities are something a little different, but traffic violence itself, it hasn't changed that much over the, the course of the, of the last decade. And during COVID in particular, you didn't really see a fall off in traffic uh, violence. It just persisted. Um, and uh, some places uh, like in Community Board 12, uh, we were lucky that you know during 2020, we did see a decrease in traffic violence uh, for 2020, uh, but now it has totally rebounded and we're back just as bad as we ever were in the early 20 teens. So then the other half of the question is, did police enforcement of dangerous driving behaviors change in a way that was consistent with this really flat zero trend in traffic violence? And I was pretty shocked when I plotted, made the plot, um, the total number of moving violations issued, they, there's two data sets, there's a, um, historical data set that covers 2018 to 2022 and then there's a year-to-date data set what you see is um, police enforcement for all kinds of moving violations was really high until 2020 and then there's this huge drop like an 80 percent drop in issuance of moving violations um, maybe it was COVID itself maybe it was the you know protests that happened that summer I don't know um, but we ne the, the number of moving violations never recovered. So right now we're sitting uh, at the total number of moving violations of New York City is only about half of what it was pre-COVID. And if you look at like dangerous driving behaviors, like I just took a look at speeding and also running red lights, um, those, uh, especially um, the running red light enforcement really fell off like uh, post-COVID and it still hasn't come back. And speeding, uh, issuing speeding tickets has come back somewhat. But um, so what we see is that police enforcement for traffic violations is, is way down post COVID. So they're, they're just not enforcing those rules. I don't know why they're not enforcing those rules, um, but traffic violence, or that's like people, you know, getting life altering injuries, they, that's up. and. In our neighborhood, um, we kind of have a peak this year in in um, injuries, and hopefully, not, but so far we have a lot of fatalities because early on 
this year we had um, that car that ran into the restaurant. And so we had a huge number of um, injuries in CB12 early this year. And we've already had two fatalities. Typically CB12 only has two or three uh, traffic um, uh, related fatalities per year. So that's quite a lot for us to get so early on. And um, so, so yeah, enforcement fell during COVID and never recovered. That's exactly what happened. And I tried to analyze it different ways. I wish that uh, you know somebody from NYP traffic enforcement would follow up and say like kind of an explanation for why it's happening. And um, I'll just add like, you know, one of my big motivators is that my commute when I take the subway is I cross the street at West 215 in Broadway. Every single day, someone speeds through that light. And every single, after the lights turn red and every single day I see a near miss. And um, a lot of my neighbors, they called about the red light cameras. Of course, there's New York state throttling on the number of cameras we can have installed. Um, and it's just, it's, it's pretty frustrating because I, I really do feel quite unsafe um, crossing Broadway, especially that intersection. It's an intersection where the, the, the lights, they're not really so much for the cars to turn. The intersection is there because that's where the one train is so the people can get to their station. Right. No, it's busy. Yeah. Um, Allegra, thank you for laying that out. Well, doing the work and laying it out. Um, I have to... And I know you sent that um, to public safety as well. Um, and I think we, we, I, I will send a follow up about uh, 215th Street because, you know, they invited you to. I, and, um, you know, it's just ter- it's terrifying. Um, so yeah, if if yeah, NYPD but we could... have to, we're going to have to. I mean. If it's not going to happen through public safety, then I guess we just need it. We need a channel to traffic enforcement, um, and uh, and maybe, and uh, you know, the, sort of my idea is also to see because Ebenezer said, you know, they they used to come sometimes to DSC. So, like, if even if we could get it back, like they came once a quarter or something like that, that would still be a lot more than what we have now. Um, Leo, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Did you take a look at Crash Mapper just for the last, for last month? Um, Yes, I did, I have the numbers. Okay, why don't you just, yeah, tell us what's, what's happened recently. Yeah, so in the district we have 71 total accidents. Um, nine crashes involving bikes, uh, e- I'm sorry, e-bikes and mopeds. Uh, in those accidents, 33 were reported injured. Um, out of those 33, eight cyclists. Now, I'm sorry, are you giving like, uh, sorry, January through April or are you giving what's, yeah, is that January through April you're giving? Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just taking like a quick look just because that one where somebody plowed into Inwood Bar and Grill, like just it it is, I mean, it was a big bad thing, but I'm just trying to understand, you know, because like normally, thank God, we don't have a multiple injury like that. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of action on 179th. Um, And I'm just looking at the pattern. Uh, 207th, 10th Avenue is always, you know, always a lot of activity there as well. Um, and St. Nicholas is the upper part of St. Nicholas. Also a decent amount of action. And then, I'm sorry, it was 29 total crashes. 29? Okay. All right. Um, 
All right, let's keep at it. Jim shared with me, and um, and maybe people have seen it. There have been sort of two big articles that relate to different aspects of Vision Zero, um, and thing things are not going well. You know, they 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 went better for a while, um, and they're really not they're not going well. They're not, they, and they haven't been lately. Um, and so, Jim. I don't know. I've just, I've just sort of looked at those because one of them had some stuff that I maybe we want to spend a little time with um, because I think it's it's easy sometimes as we all go about our movement on the streets and stuff like that. And you're just sort of like, why does it have to be this way? Or or there's pushback on something. But the bottom line is that you know, besides things that are sort of designed about around sustainability and climate change and getting people out of cars and trying to save the planet, you know, there's also this thing of saving lives and keeping people from people from either being killed or seriously injured on our streets. And again, it got better for a while and now it really isn't. Um, so, you know, we can't really lose sight of that. Uh, does anybody have anything, Jim? Sorry. I just wanted to comment that historically 179th Street, which is the main way of getting to the George Washington Bridge on the city streets, that has been problematical for um, decades and decades. And I think um, for a while, I think it may have been, been through the, the council, the, the congressman sponsorship, there was actually some traffic direction there done by the city. But I, I think that traffic direction is essential and it's particularly essential when there's a problem on the bridge and it, it just doesn't occur. And in fact, I myself was, was practically, in fact, it was infuriating. Some guy practically ran me over and when I tried to walk in front of his car, he started at me again. I, I, the good thing I didn't have a rock, he wouldn't have a windshield, it was just crazy. So that, that street is really problematical. And um, I think since I believe things were better while there was that funding for the, the, the traffic control people there, we should make that one of our priorities. We should possibly even pass a resolution about that street. And if, if you know, the other one that's particularly bad and it, it may even be near where the, the, the bridge is over the Harlem River is 207th Street. But you know, insofar as they're really dangerous, we have to make noise and actually get some personnel there because you know that's just money and lives are lives. Thank you. Um, no, very good point, Jim. And often say that, you know, we change streets to get people moving better and public transport, the buses moving better, and we change streets to make them safer when they are dangerous. However, we don't change streets that are otherwise fine. They're just not having traffic enforcement. Um, and But coming to sort of the, the, the essential and what Jim is saying is let's do spend some time thinking about, you know, highlighting again, what we're seeing in the data, et cetera, for, you know, DOT is always happy to do a walkthrough um, and then to, you know, potentially move into a resolution to sort of, yeah, to request, because I think a lot of times, you know, DOT comes to us and they say, we saw this dangerous thing and we want to do this, but, you know, but, but part of this process is getting us more familiar with our own safety data and the kind of thing that Allegra raised tonight. Um, I think that would be a great idea. Um, Maria, and then let me come back. Adam Fran, I see, I see you in the Q&A. So Lyle, I'm gonna circle with you after Maria. Thank you, Debbie, again. Um, on that walkthrough by 158th Street, the embankment and 158, we, I mentioned to you last month, I was gonna send you some pictures about that sign that needs to be changed on 58th Street and Broadway, uh, turning left, uh, going into that uh, bicycle pass. I think that 
I also spoke and Bruce also agrees with me that something needs to be done there. So I'll let you go through this month, but I, for next month, I think we need to address that issue because it's really critical. But also I remember that um, I am reaching an age that I had to be a slower, I walk slower than before. So I need to make sure that when I want to reach a place, I do it alive and that someone doesn't have to carry me on an ambulance. So thank you so much for all of you to listen to me. Um, but and just while I have you, Maria, we we did raise it when we were doing the walkthrough of just a general like some changes got made in that area. Yeah. In two in two different pieces, but just like let's see how it's all fitting together. So just to make sure I understand, it is for people coming north on Broadway and making right. the left, left on onto one fifty eight. Right. Going right. down. That bicycle lane and the ambulance okay. is going at the Marie, same time. Maria, okay. I'm no, not no, talking about the bicycle. I'm not talking about the bicycle no, lane. No, no, I'm no, asking no, you what just, sign did were you referring to that you felt like one there that needed... I, before before you could turn there, but now you have to go up to 159th Street, then make left turn there, and the bus number four coming from Fort Washington by uh, McDonald, that corner, is, is crazy, and it shouldn't be. It's safer, the sun, you know, oh. turning on 158, going down, instead of going all the way up one more block, turn around and facing a bus coming, you know, for Washington Avenue, I'm making a right turn going to down Broadway then. All right. All right. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a horse of a different feather or whatever the saying. Okay. Um, let me, okay. All right. I got it. Um, from Northbound Broadway. Okay. Um, Lyle, we have reporting in the Q&A of our favorite topic, lights on the Henry Hudson, northbound, north of 181st, but before Dykeman. Are you, you guys in charge of that on that strip? I think we are. Um... I last update I or last thing I heard from our street lighting division. Um, I know it's under review. Um, that's a decent stretch there, so it's going to take a little bit of time uh, to get an update. But um, it is something that uh, our street lighting team is looking at currently. Oh, they are okay because um, Adam says he, you know, he's submitted three one one requests. So hopefully they've found their way to you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. they found their way, and that's why people are taking a look. But um, yeah, and also came up at the um, at the parks meeting, uh, the joint parks meeting uh, a few weeks ago. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you Liz for covering that. Okay. Yeah, Liz brought it up. So um, it is on our radar, um, but nothing unfortunately new to report tonight. But uh, it is under review with our our folks in the street lighting. Okay. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Jay? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, could we get an update on the art project in the 191st Street tunnel to the one train? Uh, I, uh, after the city painted over the uh, graffiti art that was there, uh, I believe that was the DOT's responsibility. It was announced that they were going to request that artists paint the area and make it more attractive. And I was just wondering if anything happened on that. Um, nothing new, just um, as a brief summary. Um, you are correct. Uh, DOT is responsible for the maintenance of the 191st Street Tunnel by the one train. And uh, we did paint that tunnel uh, not so long ago. Um, the plan is to uh, solicit artists uh, for the tunnel. Um, it would be 
essentially a temporary art installation. Um, we do have a capital project uh, that is forthcoming in order to basically revamp completely that tunnel um, in order to make it uh, environmentally safer and up to code. Um, so I know that a bunch of artists did submit uh, some potential uh, drawings for the tunnel. Um, I know our art division was looking into that, uh, into the submissions. Um, I haven't heard anything from them as far as if they made a decision um, or, you know, what the next steps are. Um, but we are having conversations uh, upcoming uh, internally. Uh, that's the next step. So hopefully there should be something to report fairly soon. Um, but we are in the process of, you know, soliciting uh, your request from our that sort of thing um, to see, uh, you know, what would be in there, at least for the time being, um, you know, while we're trying to get the capital project uh, straightened out and moving forward. Uh, so hopefully we should be coming back to you in a little bit, both an update on uh, the artists and somewhere down the line, an update on the capital project. Um, so we do have a couple of things uh, for you in the pipeline. Okay, thanks, Lyle. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Um, all right, I'm just looking in the Q&A, um, just to remind, well, the, it's, it's not really conversation on sidewalk use by bikes and scooters, it's, it's that it's enforcement, it doesn't get enforced, it's been raised, people feel very vulnerable. Um, but I, you know, this committee can't speak for where, um, NYPD is on those kinds of enforcement issues. Um, with that, I think we're ready for a motion to adjourn. Anyone? <laughs> Thanks for this. <laughs> Second. Hey. Excellent job. <laughs> um, yeah, I know this is a lot of old stuff, but um it was it, it was good. I feel like we got through a lot. Um thank you everybody. Uh meeting is adjourned. Um thanks for everybody's Happy participation. Mother Day. Happy Mother thank Day for all. Thank you. Be well. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Have a good night.